Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I'll start with just a couple of announcements. Remember that this Saturday is the self-care retreat from 10 to 2 at our office. Uh, includes a fabulous lunch and spa treatments and lots of discussion on habit change. Um, at this particular retreat we're going we're gonna to focus on uh, some knowledge about what to do and why to do it, but a lot on the impediments to doing it. There's a whole big difference between knowing what you're supposed to do and actually following through and doing it. I think we've all experienced that, right? So um, this would be a great opportunity for you to learn, uh, for you to learn from one of our great colleagues, Mary Marshall, who is really excellent at helping people with behavior change. I learn something from her every time I listen to her speak. So uh, if you're interested, uh, Pam Popper at MSN.com. Remember also that this summer diet and lifestyle course, which we offer three times a year, but every couple of years we do the course with the celebrity instructors like Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Barnard, uh, Dr. Schultz, Dr. Ralph Moss, and etc. So um, we have some excellent packages where you can combine this with some of our other educational courses. Courses. So if you're interested in learning more about that, send me an email as well. And then I wanted to talk about something uh, before I get into a topic that I chose for today that I think is really important. And it goes to a lot of emails that I get from people who ask me questions about um, minuscule things in the diet that we call this the nutritional weeds around here, getting into the nutritional weeds and, and almost degenerating into nutritional nonsense. And I don't mean this in a, in a disrespectful sort of way, but, um, but people who are afraid that they're, that they're eating uh, too much of this food or too much of that food, or they're worried about two tablespoons of brown sugar on their oatmeal in the morning. I know I'm not supposed to eat any sugar, but I really don't like oatmeal unless I put something on it and is that going to hurt me? And if I put dried fruit in my salad, is that going to make a difference and, and this sort of thing. And so, um, and then of course we get into the coffee's going to kill you and processed food's going to kill you and don't eat any bread and on and on and on. So here's the point that I want to get to and I think this is really, really important and I talk about it a lot here with our members. So when you are eating a bad diet, and let's, let's, you know, how do we define a bad diet? Well, I used to eat a bad diet, lots of cheese, lots of animal foods, lots of junk, lots and lots of junk, uh, way too much wine drinking at night and all that sort of thing. When I was doing that kind of thing, I've been dehydrated, and I made a change over to a plant-based diet, and I didn't eat so much junk, and I got rid of the dairy, and of course, all kinds of wonderful things happened. I lost a lot of weight and all that sort of thing. So what happened is my risk is my risk of having uh, developing diseases, particularly some that run in my family that are very concerning, it dropped like a rock. The risk, it went down. I, I don't think we can quantify it necessarily, but um, one way that I can relate it to you is that I'm the first person in my family, first woman in my family on my mother's side who doesn't have rheumatoid arthritis by the time I was 50. I'm 62 now and I don't have it. So I know that I made that, that, that big change made a huge difference in my risk of a lot of bad things happening. Okay, so now what happens is once you make that big change and you're getting the pattern right, you start looking at what would I gain if I never had any alcohol? What would I gain if I never had anything processed? What would I gain if I, um, if I never had something with refined sugar in it? Okay, all those little things. Well, there may be a reduction in risk, but it's very hard to quantify, and it's most likely very tiny. So instead of reducing my risk of breast cancer by, by half, for example, or reducing my risk of rheumatoid arthritis by down to almost nothing with the changes that I made, the big changes, now we're talking about fractions of a percent. And so when you start doing this, the first thing is it distracts from the big idea and it makes people often unable to comply in the long term. And nobody gets better from practicing dietary habits that are excellent for three weeks. You only get better if you can do this for a sustained period of time. So it somewhat becomes self-defeating when we focus on these little tiny things like are two tablespoons of uh, brown sugar on my oatmeal going to kill me? Then I'm being a little facetious here, but I think you know what I'm talking about. So that's the, the first thing is we distract from that. Second thing is we're talking about tiny, tiny little reductions in, in risk that we almost can't quantify. And if we put them um, in front of people and said, look, um, instead of having alcohol as a treat, you know, on special occasions like your birthday, have none and you can reduce your risk of breast cancer by, you know, one half of one percent. Who would sign up for that? 
okay? I wouldn't. I mean, it's just not worth it for me for a half a percent. Um, the same thing with maybe I would gain some tiny, tiny advantage if I never ate anything processed. It's not worth it to me, okay? And, and so, I, and, and this comes to a point of integrity, I think. I'm very critical of medical professionals who issue instructions to patients to take a certain drug or to have a procedure that reduces their risk of something bad happening by a tiny, tiny percent. So for example, and if you look at the general population of people who are taking statin drugs, you're talking about a 1.1% reduction in the risk of heart attack, stroke, or all-cause mortality. I talked about that on video clips a few weeks ago. Well, if I'm going to criticize doctors for recommending a drug that has significant side effects, for a 1.1% reduction in the risk, which nobody would really sign up for if they understood that. I think from an integrity standpoint, we have to make sure those of us who are promoting diet lifestyle change aren't doing exactly the same thing, which is being disingenuous and that we're not really telling people, if you do this, there's a tiny, tiny risk reduction. And, um, and, and then people thinking that it's much more important than that. And I think that there's a lot of that going on, which is why people are writing to me and saying, you know, gee, am I gonna hurt myself if I have brown sugar on my oatmeal? Am I going to hurt myself if I have cookies on Christmas morning or something? And, and the answer is, I've, and I say this only half kidding, if what's standing between you and death is cookies on Christmas and brown sugar on your oatmeal, I don't think this is the place to help you. I think you're way too far gone for us to be of much use to you, really. So, so anyway, I hope that you understand that. There's a lot of um, uh, debate about this, and, and the, you, I think you might understand why we call it the nutritional weeds, just getting involved in such minutia that makes such a little difference in people's lives that I just don't think we want to go there. So anyway, let's go on to today's topic. And I found this really interesting to share with you. In recent years, the number of celiac diagnoses has increased significantly. Now, some people have speculated about the reasons, and there are a lot of them. Um, and frankly, I haven't seen any studies that confirm any of these theories. And, and there are things like, uh, perhaps if we don't give, uh, if mothers don't eat gluten-containing foods when they're pregnant, or you wait longer to introduce gluten-containing foods than you normally would, and, and on and on and on. And I haven't seen any studies that have actually confirmed this. In fact, generally, they've been failures. Genetics does play a role, but not all people who have family members with celiac disease end up developing celiac disease, so that's certainly not the only thing at play here. One contributing factor, I think, is that more people are being tested earlier for celiac disease. It used to be diagnosed much later. Fortunately, in this era of information availability, a lot of people get online, they start looking for um, the, you know, causes of their symptoms, find out it might be celiac and get tested, and, and I think some people are finding out much earlier that they have celiac than they would have uh, 25 or 30 years ago. But a new study suggests something interesting, which is that antibiotic use may be contributing to the increased incidence of celiac. And I found two studies um, that were um, interesting um, uh, uh, on this issue. So the first one, researchers conducted an observational study of all children born in Denmark between 1995 and 2012, and in Norway between 2004 and 2012. Data were gathered on a total of 1.7 million children, and of those kids, 3,346 were diagnosed with celiac disease. So it tells us the incidence is pretty low still. In both the Danish and Norwegian children, exposure to antibiotics during the first year of life was predictive of celiac disease. The findings were strengthened by the fact that the effect was dose dependent with each additional prescription increasing the risk. The effect was not limited to any particular class of antibiotics. All of them seemed to have the same effect. Another observational study showed that early life infections themselves increased the risk of celiac disease. The Norwegian mother and child cohort study included almost 73,000 children born between 2000 and 2009 and showed that children who had more infections had a higher risk of developing celiac disease and this relationship was also dose dependent. More infections resulted in a higher risk. Now, the limitation of these studies, both of them, is that they're observational and they don't identify a cause and effect relationship. But antibiotics change the microbiome of the gastrointestinal tract and this disruption has been shown to be a contributing factor for many other diseases. Well, based on this information, there are a couple of things that parents can do that may lower the risk of celiac disease for their children. 
One is preventing infections. And one of the major causes of infections, particularly ear infections in children, is cow's milk. Kids get other infections for other reasons, but this is an easy infection to avoid. You just don't give babies and children cow's milk or cow's milk products. The other controllable factor identified here would be antibiotic treatment itself. Now, doctors are responsible for some of the overprescribing of antibiotics. There's no question about that. But parents are also part of the problem. They ask for antibiotics. They sometimes put a lot of pressure on doctors to prescribe them, and many doctors feel uncomfortable refusing to prescribe. But according to an analysis of 17 studies, 80% of children who have acute ear infections get better on their own without any antibiotic treatment at all. So there's a good reason for parents to back off and only get an antibiotic prescription for a child if the ear infection and persists and doesn't resolve on its own in a short period of time. Now, will these strategies lower the risk of celiac disease for children? Perhaps. Will they improve the overall health of children in a positive way? Absolutely. So there's nothing bad about less antibiotic treatment or avoiding cow's milk. Only good things can come from those two things. And we may find out over time that this relationship is really uh, a strong one and you could be reducing the risk of a child developing celiac disease as well. All right, well, that's all for today. As usual, hit the subscribe button if you're not a subscriber. Um, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you Thursday with more news.